fine day for a protest mm -hmm. or a counter protest. Every day is a <laughs> Every day. <laughs> protest of a protest. On Parliament lawns. Oh, Their it's massive. Choice. Their choice. Their choice. Hands off the heart. Well, let me do it. I'm not, not assaulting you. Are. He is assaulting me. No. Yes. We're you standing here. That's my dad. It's my dad. So now you've fucking crossed the big fucking line. Come on. Move. Move. He was Move. going aggressively at Move. someone. Move. So at the moment, New Zealand has the highest level of equal representation between the genders that it has ever had. And people do ask, you know, what do women bring? Unless we are at that decision-making table on everything, we're going to be ghettoised. I think it's essential to democracy that everyone is represented at every level. Clearly she's a, a feisty woman. I think it's great the exhibition has a good balance of Pākehā and Māori women and really brings out a lot of stories people aren't familiar with. You know. I have to Snapchat it. <laughs> when you get a critical mass of women, you start to get more issues that are relevant to women addressed. When I was elected in 81, there were eight of us, but there were only four the time before. There'd never been more than four. You know, that had been the high water mark. They didn't expect women to be there. So I sat on the select committee for this bill uh, on domestic violence, which provided for the you know, domestic violence protection orders and so on. The law is fine, but it hasn't led to sufficient behaviour change, unfortunately. Otherwise, why would we have the highest reported rate of family violence in all of the developed world? After all these years of legal equality and reasonable legal frameworks, for example, on domestic and sexual and gender-based violence, the issues haven't gone away. Whenever I'm speaking offshore, uh, on issues to do with women's leadership and I say, well, by the way, New Zealand has had three women Prime Ministers in more than half the last 21 years. No one else has had three. People look to us, really, for leadership. Where is my bag? Oh, there. In the darkest corner of the closet. Like, I'm not going to use it. I don't need to take a lot because most of my clothes for work live in my office. Um, so they're just like, there's a little closet and all of the clothes that I wear in the house because I don't need, you know, formal things here. It's the best. We met at a charity fundraiser that Guy was hosting. Yeah, our relationship is a bit different because I spend three days a week uh, in Wellington at Parliament. This week we get to pass Jan Logie's Domestic Violence Victims Protection Bill into law. Uh, which gives 10 days of leave to victims of domestic violence. Ordinarily, you know, you work and your work is contained to what it is. It doesn't ripple out and go out there and be interpreted by different people in different ways. I feel it through that social media stuff with um, the comments and the threats. We always report to both Facebook and parliamentary security, which was something that Guy actually kind of triggered because I wasn't taking it very seriously. It's a lot easier to send a death threat these days than it used to be, like, back in the day. Like, back in the day, you had to put some real commitment in. You had to, like, write a letter, maybe out of your own blood, put it in an envelope, post it to somewhere, right? Now, you just type it out in, like, three seconds, and it's hard to know what to take seriously and what not to take seriously. But what we've learned from Goloriza's experience is that there's a lot of, a lot of nut bars out there, mm -hmm. and um, they say uh, horrific things and really serious things. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know what the risk is. I was getting hacked constantly and parliamentary security said that it had to be reported to Interpol. It started to get quite overwhelming at one point and now it's sort of at a point where it's 
more just racism. Another lecture from you, golly. Get yourself stuffed up by one of these low lives, then tell us how it's going to be. God damn it, girl, you're fine as fuck. No offense. I'd like to poll your electorate. Go back to where you came from and fix the problem there before trying to tell others how to run their country. Their like, people talk to her as though she, this isn't her country. I mean, she's been here longer than I've been alive. I'm really bad at matching clothes. I like that dress, but I don't know if she'd wear it inside the house. Golris's feminism is intersectional and the bigotry we get is intersectional. She's a left-wing woman, she's Iranian, first refugee in parliament. But with that comes certain feelings. Basically, anytime Golris makes a strong statement on any issue, she will get angry men sending threats. It is a blokey culture. Just after the election and a new party was in opposition, I was down in the lobby surrounded by a bunch of their MPs and they were all making jokes about how they had smaller penises now that they were in opposition and there was a woman with them. It was bizarre. These were like growing men and they still have that attitude. And if you can imagine sitting at a caucus table, being one of the few women in your caucus, I can't imagine how hard it would be to not just stand up and say fuck you all, like, to be honest. I feel radiant and full of energy. <laughs> I am invincible. Mm -hmm. I am a superstar. Joy is my natural state. That's how I maintain my sanity around here. <laughs> I'm in my 13th year of Parliament. My first three years were in opposition, nine years in government, and now I'm in, in opposition again. So they've made me a whole calendar. And you get to sort of, is that, see, there you go. That's what you wanted, isn't it? People are going to think I'm really weird now, if there was ever any doubt in their mind. <laughs> <laughs> These are my demanding constituents. <laughs> so I certainly think I'm a feminist. I'm not sure I'm so big on gender politics. You know, if we sort of start labelling everything to be based on gender, then we almost give it an, an, an excuse to sort of cop out on. I've been accused of being a prostitute and a class A drug user and um, a benefit fraudster and um, someone that doesn't care about other people. I mean, you name it. But do you know what keeps me awake or gets me really angry? As lower paid women that can't spend time with their kids, they're the ones that really get me going on my feminism. I feel like we have a real role um, to be fighting for those that feel like they don't have the same strength and the same voice. To be honest, the online bullying didn't make me change at all. I'm always by someone behind a keyboard. I had one that really stands out and um, and, and it was really this whole connotation of, you know, that someone should, um, you know, sexually violate me effectively. Um, I ring the police every time, every single time I pass them on, um, because they've got to be called out for it, and they've got to know that actually what they say matters. Um, I might be really strong, and I'm loved, and I'm supported, um, and I just think that if they think that that's acceptable, well, what about those people that aren't as strong as I am and aren't as supported? We as particularly younger women have a responsibility to keep ourselves safe. How we, as a society, evolve into a place where women shouldn't have to be doing that. I think that's one of the biggest areas that we haven't conquered yet, and I'm not sure I know the answer. There's some really good intentions in Jan Logie's domestic violence bill, but we don't think it's good law. And as a consequence of that, we're not going to be voting for it. To be quite blunt with you, not a single woman won't get beaten because of this piece of legislation. Man, this garden, it's got a life of its own. Yeah. <laughs> Just to remind you, I have done everything. I started from scratch. There was no gardens here, nothing. Yeah, 
این کتری رو باید بندازیم بیرون اون رو روز اول رو بگم We came from Iran and that's us, yeah, that's how Goris was that nine years old. Why did you do it? For, to, to come to New yeah. Zealand? Now, did I want really, I um, live in Iran, I raised you in Iran, but to be the woman had no rights. And, and they were saying to my little girl, I'll cover your hair. And that becomes a person's life. When you put that on your head, it means you are obeying somebody else. You know, I don't like that. I don't, I want to live my life privately. So when you, I start speaking out, I got in trouble all the time. But when you say I could get in trouble, that means something really different in New Zealand than in Iran. Of course. So what do you mean? Just a few weeks ago, a girl activist, she spoke up. Her body was found the other day. Without, you know, just mm -hmm. any explanation, she got arrested somewhere. Sure. By who knows? Nobody knows. Her who. body was burnt because she was probably raped and tortured. They didn't want that show, so they burned her body. So that's how, uh, you know, just the dangerous was. I really, really didn't want to raise you in Iran. I, I had a big responsibility as a mother and as a woman too, as a human as well. So I wanted to get out. So Shakti is a national organization and we have five refuges and eight drop-in centers nationally. The idea that feminism exists in all cultures organically, mm. like it is ours and it is strong. Now it's just carrying forward this entire discussion of understanding sari as traditional and I think that's, that's a very mm. interesting take because sari is a representation of Indian feminism and it takes away the whole western understanding from feminism and in doing so i think it breaks stereotypes beautifully so is it normally like this constant thing where it's pointed out that you're not from here yeah a little bit and it might is be like, like not directly like that but like you can tell what the underlying intentions are mm. so it's like they're trying to make you feel like you're lesser or like you don't belong when you know perfectly well that like you're doing fine, you're just as you're just as good as all the other girls and students. I wonder if any of you guys, um, you know, would you ever see yourselves as politicians? We identified that young people can actually make the difference. It is an intergenerational change for it to be long term sustainable. Supposedly in New Zealand we've got formal equality with First Nation in the world to get it. But are we experiencing it? And what does that feel like for those of us who are from different cultures as well? On top of that, it's all about the race stuff. So ginger, lemongrass with kawakawa or lemon and honey chamomile, peach and passion fruit, green tea with kawakawa, peppermint spearm, <laughs> spearmint with kawakawa, we have options. I was born in the, in the 70s, um, grew up in the 80s and 90s, and one of my all-time heroes um, has been uh, Sir Richard Hadley, and because I absolutely love sport, and I can just remember him going off to Australia, and uh, the Aussies were knew he was a good player, so they'd try and put him off, and he'd get the chance, you know, Hadley's a wanker, and... And I used to think the way he performed was amazing because he used it to kind of motivate him and he'd often take wickets and then it had silenced them. But what I've managed to do through sport in my career is to channel all of that and actually use it to inspire me to keep going. I've just found that um, the more uh, the opposition, I guess, the greater my resolve. There's a correlation between LGBT members of parliament and progressive law reform. I've advocated for LGBT rights through the passage of the Marriage Bill. I think a lot of the comments are usually based on religious doctrine. So, you know, I'm going to go to hell or um, I'm going to burn to death. And You don't realise until afterwards how much stress there is, really. Mm -hmm. 
I think every time I stand up and speak out and challenge those um, particularly religious philosophies that say we're demonic or we're subhuman or uh, that we're not um, equal human beings or equal citizens, there's always um, big pushback from people who challenge my mandate. This is the time in our history, I think, where we call that stuff out. So the Me Too stuff is broader than just sexual harassment. It's actually about calling out uh, homophobia, racism, uh, discrimination, sexism, violence, abuse, all of it. It isn't just about us participating. In the public space, we've come a long way, but in the private space, we've got a long way to go. So we, as parliamentarians, need to be preoccupied with how women are represented and you know, our ability to be those decision makers, not just playing at a base level, but actually through every single institution and organisation in the world. Domestic violence? Yeah. Yeah, there used to be stuff like I'd go out with my friends, there'd always be a massive fight, and it was actually quite a quite an abusive relationship in terms of psychologically. I couldn't turn on my phone because every time I turned it on it would just be a barrage of messages that would just be something like slut. It would just be like slut, 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 slut or bitch, 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 bitch. and I'd, I'd just be like, oh well, I've got to turn my phone off. And then eventually it got really physical. It's just like pushing and shaking. And then it got to a point where a couple of times um, I got strangled. It is amazing to see people with some understanding of that, like Jan, in the house so that she can put together law change that will in fact help women escape that violence. I call on our members order of the day number one. Domestic Violence Victims Protection Bill, third reading. Ko te taonga taku ngā kau, ko taku mokopona e, e mokopona kori kori, hei aha hei ahara. Ko te menu i ko te aroha, kau e patu taku mokopona, me afi afi mai taku mokopona kori kori e. Me afi afi mai taku mokopona kori kori e. The time immediately after leaving an abusive relationship is the most dangerous time. She needs to be able to change her routine, otherwise her abuser knows where to find her. And today, as a society, we're going to support her to do that because being violence-free is actually a fundamental human right. Today, we will become the first country in the world to provide these protections as universal entitlements. Today, we stand for a future free of domestic violence. Ma whero, ma pango, ma kakariki, ka oti ai te mahi. With red and black and green, the work will be complete. Uh, Jan Logie, I think, is, is on the line. Are you there, Jan? I am. Kia ora, John. Yeah, kia ora. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little bit excited. It's been about seven years coming and the work of, you know, thousands of amazing women and unions and businesses all coming together to get this change. So it's a world first and it's pretty amazing. I think part of feeling like I have to use my voice is that my parents were refugees, that they were really politically active and they had to flee for their lives because of their political beliefs. I think moments like that really highlight the importance of having real representation in Parliament, whether that means having women there speaking to women's issues, having people from other marginalised groups there prioritising the challenges that those groups face every day. It was just one of those moments where we got to do that. For me, it's just one vote, but having been a part of that is a very humbling experience. <laughs>